Open Democracy, we've been investigating the state of freedom of information in the UK and have found that central government departments are less likely to grant an FOI uh, request in full and the appeals process is just getting longer and longer. And uh, last year we published um, a report uh, by Lucas Amin, The Art of Darkness, which paints uh, an incredibly worrying picture of the state of FOI and the obstacles that uh, journalists and, and campaigners and researchers uh, face when trying to access information under the FOI legislation. Um, but uh, during our investigation, um, we uh, discovered something called the uh, Clearinghouse, which is uh, a unit uh, operated by um, a very central government department called the Cabinet Office. And what happens is when uh, government departments and agencies uh, receive a sensitive uh, request or a, a round robin uh, request, those get flagged uh, to the uh, clearinghouse. And the, what we also discovered was that the clearinghouse also circulates a list of requests, uh, mainly originating from journalists and uh, campaigners across, uh, across other government departments, um, which also contains advice on, from the cabinet office on how other government departments should be responding to such requests. So uh, it all started back, back in uh, August 2018, following a tip-off. I submitted a Freedom of Information request uh, to get hold of documents about the clearinghouse, mainly the list of requests that they circulate and the advice given. And I used What Do They Know Pro uh, to, to, to manage my, my Freedom of Information request. Um, and unfortunately, my Freedom of Information request was rejected and I had to go all the way to the courts. So that was earlier this year. So three years in the making and we managed to get hold of the documents that we was after um, prior to oops, um, prior to um, uh, our investigation about this this clearinghouse there was there was nothing on the official uh, government website to explain to the requester what this process is which to me is highly concerning um, and it was only when we actually went to the courts uh, the Cabinet Office published more information about its processes, uh, literally a couple of weeks before I, uh, it, the hearing, uh, including a list of sort of triggers uh, for when requests, sensitive requests, uh, should be uh, forwarded to this, this clearinghouse. Um, but earlier this year, uh, thankfully, the judge ruled in our favour and uh, the judge uh, really slams the Cabinet Office for such lack of transparency. Um, now, why should you be? Why should you know people be concerned about this clearinghouse in the UK? Why should requesters be so concerned? Well, there's actually what we've discovered a lot of concerns. Um, uh, for context, the Cabinet Office has, you know, one of the worst FOI records in central government. Uh, in in central government, um, and they really do tend to lead more towards withholding information rather than disclosing it. Uh, they do have a uh, tendency to be secretive, and uh, I. It, and for the cabinet office to advise other government departments and agencies on how to respond to requests, uh, it doesn't quite sit well with me. And uh, the advice that has been released uh, is questionable. Um, the clearinghouse also um, asks uh, government departments to send them the uh, drafts of FOI uh, responses uh, before they're sent out to the requester. And it indicates a certain level of control. Um, on what can and cannot be uh, released to the public. Um, we also uh, know that it is contributing to um, uh, delays uh, experienced by FOI requesters. So we had one campaigner who has worked very, very hard on trying to access documents about the infected blood scandal, a huge scandal in the UK, uh, charting back from the 1980s. And uh, he uh, sent off a freedom of information request to one good government department that got forwarded to the clearinghouse and then we managed to get hold of internal documents where one can see the treasury interacting with the clearinghouse the clearinghouse is saying you know actively discouraging this uh, department not to release information but the treasury was saying yes we really do want to give this information and that whole process lasted for five months and we all know that well we know in the UK that you know uh, requests should be answered within 20 working days um and uh, very recently, actually last week, I believe, we found that the uh, clearinghouse was interfering with FOI requests uh, about an incredibly tragic uh, um, sort of the Grenfell uh, Tower fire tragedy that killed uh, 72 people. Um, we know that other journalists have uh, 
their request had been flagged to this, this clearinghouse, uh, a, a Times journalist saw that um, he managed to get hold of documents where it was found that his uh, Freedom of Information request had been flagged to this central this, this clearinghouse because he's a journalist. Um, and there was another journalist who found that the uh, clearinghouse was um, working to block the release of documents to journalists, um, even though uh, the Department for International Trade was very happy to release the information. So um, yes, our open, our open democracy investigation into the clearinghouse has had a huge uh, impact. Um, journalists, politicians across the, uh, the political spectrum, they've um, demanded an inquiry into this, this process. Um, and in the summer, we eventually did managed to spark parliamentary inquiry, which is really good news. It's, it's going to happen uh, later this year. Uh, they are currently um, uh, so, um, gathering up, accepting evidence, which I have uh, about to file tomorrow. Um, but uh, no, it's, and we also reported that the uh, cabinet office is conducting its own inquiry into the clearing house, which is quite funny considering how earlier this year they rubbished our reporting and uh, they said that we were ridiculous and tendentious. Um, so there we have it. Um, hopefully this parliamentary inquiry will lead to positive change in the way FOI requests are dealt with uh, in central government departments. Um, I know I've sped through those slides and um, yes, that's it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senna. That's uh, really, really interesting. And yeah, that, that very, very quick tour does not do justice to, to the amount of wonderful work you guys are, are doing over there. We very much support it. Um, we have done our evidence as well for, for the uh, inquiry and I encourage anyone else in the UK uh, that, is, that is interested in this to, to look into that and submit their own evidence if they, uh, if they have any. Uh, great. Okay, moving swiftly on. Um, we have a video next. Unfortunately, our next speaker wasn't able to join us live. Um, but here we go. This is Lizette Hamming of the Dutch Flemish Association for Investigative Journalists. And this is Lost in Europe, deploying the Alvitali network on cross border investigation. There, I'm, I've, I've been trying to um, set up my laptop uh, in a way that you can actually look at uh, a person which would be me now and look at the slides as well but um it didn't work so um i'm gonna switch to the slides uh in a second and um guide you through it um uh at the background I'm Lisa Thumming. I'm an investigative journalist from the Netherlands, relatively new in the field of journalism. I have a legal background and I've been asked to help Lost in Europe with um, their freedom of information procedures. And we ended up filing requests in uh, 14 um, different European countries this year. There's two pending at the moment, so that would make a total of 16 and six of these um, have been filed already via the Elevatelli platforms and one with um, via Vraagdenstaat uh, which is a similar um, freedom of information platform but running with different software. I will tell a bit about the aim of our project then the freedom of information procedure and the uh, learnings that we uh, that we can share using the Elevatelli platforms. So the aim of the Lost in Europe project that started in 2016 is gathering the stories of 10,000 missing migrant children in Europe. And missing means um, in the sense that they are missing um, from public records. In the, last, in the past five years, uh, Lost in Europe had, has set up seven different files and different angles to the to the projects and working together with 20 journalists across Europe. There's been uh, quite some uh, publications. There's been more and more research uh, and information about pushbacks at uh, external European borders. Pushbacks meaning migrant being pushed back at the European border. And uh, Geesje was uh, in the, the forests at um, different uh, border crossings in Europe where she 
found uh, torn pieces of paper, for example, at the French-Italian border. So we decided to, to look for pushbacks in Europe and um, concentrated on um, European countries that are part of the European, U European Union uh, and in specifically um, part of the Schengen Agreement. Not only, but that's, um, those were one of the first questions we, we had to ask, ask ourselves. Um, and uh, Monica, uh, if one of the journalists involved in the project, dived into the existing research, um, mostly done by NGOs on the ground uh, and mostly done uh, at the borders you can see here um, on the map she made. So we were wondering where should we start? The documents that Geesje found and also most of the documents that we found in the NGO research um, online were more general uh, arrest documents. Only in France we, um, we found a, 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 a refus d'entrée. We thought at the beginning was the best way to, uh, to start um, by asking for these refus d'entrées in France. And our first, first version was um, asking for the actual documents and then we changed that um, after also after um, talking about it with other people, uh, uh, various various of them uh, via the Alavatelli network. I'll come back to that later. That uh, we changed it to asking for the data sets, and then we decided in the end to ask for the total numbers and expecting to uh, that expecting that those numbers would be inside of data sets and not so much asking for the original documents, but uh, yeah, also because we were not interested in the documents themselves, but more in the figures. Um, so in the end, uh, this is our freedom information request. Geesje, of course, she knew that I was involved with uh, um, the Dutch Alavatelli platform. And I told her that there are many others in Europe that we can use to file these um, re requests. And I told her that back then, not uh, a lot of the platforms um, had the public, had the um, pro version yet, so that we might have uh, to file in public. Uh, and she immediately said that that was not a problem for her at all. And I think that most of us expects, expect that for journalists in general, the uh, preferred option would be to file um, uh, hidden that you don't need that you cannot see that on the platform. We looked at um, all the Alavatelli platforms and in the end decided to use um, as many of them as possible and discover that some of them were down. The, there is no platform in Spain anymore, not in. Italy at the moment and the Norwegian one was down. We started on the 21st of February 2021 filing France, Germany, Italy and Slovenia because those were the countries that we found documents in the NGO reports. For filing the requests we needed some general freedom of information information that we uh, gathered uh, using the Alavatelli network. I will skip to the learnings um, so far and please don't hesitate to contact me if you want to know more about um, our project, our freedom of information uh, procedures, uh, experiences, um, the Alavatelli platforms, um, the differences between the um, freedom of information procedures in different countries. I'd be happy to tell you about this. Um, our learnings would be, um, for me, <laughs> it's it was really obvious that it was a really good thing. I was really happy that I've been to the Alavatelli conference uh, uh, in, in, I think it was two years ago, because there was a lot of the people that I got in contact with this past year were people that I met at the conference, which made it a lot easier um, to get in touch. Um, and also the Google platform sort of works. Maybe it can work better if we would be able to communicate in different ways and in different way but we I, I did get um, a helpful reaction 
go public if you can, because I also noticed that uh, it is easier to collaborate on a public request than having to give permissions or uh, password sharing, pat passwords or anything like that. On the freedom of information procedure itself, it was really smart to check national freedom of information rules and regulations because they differ. I expected them to differ, but I didn't know in what way. So I was happy that we did, um, which also made me realize that I want to change the learning to let's set up a place where we can collect these national freedom of information rules and regulations and share it. Um, some more learnings are look for local national context because it helps. Um, the fifth would be to double check whether the data is online or public already. Um, because we found out for in Hungary, Hungary, for example, it's most uh, it's the best example. There was quite some information online already. We didn't expect that. There's more uh, shared by the authorities than we could ever imagined. Um, using the Alvatelli platforms, I found out that an English translation would be very helpful, and the Swedish platform has it. And I was thinking also for the Dutch platform, why not? Because it's there. Um, I had, I knew the I know the platform by heart. So for me, also in languages that I don't speak, I, I was translating everything all the time. But um, it helped that I already knew uh, how the platform is structured and what I could find where. So um, that was a yeah. That's not for everybody, of course. Also something that the Dutch platform does not have. Uh, is uh, using the space for information and explanation about the authorities that we can do in the platform. I realized if, you, if you're not so aware on how the authorities work on what, like I am in the Netherlands and that's why I didn't uh, immediately think of using that uh, possibility, um, is very valuable. So um, let's use it. Um, Eighth would be uh, that I, I noticed that paid staff uh, were quicker and more helpful in assisting. It's not uh, against the volunteers that helped because I know as a volunteer for the platform, every hour you spend helping other people is a valuable hour and difficult to, to, uh, to offer um, in a way. Um, but it, I, it is for, for me running the Dutch platform a valuable learning when combining it with um, requests and freedom of information procedures not filed via the platforms, it can be quite um, overwhelming. And um, I'd be happy to share how we're managing that at the moment. Um, in general, um, please know where to find me, and I hope it was helpful. Ah, that was great. Um, unfortunately, as I said, Lizette isn't actually here with us right now. Um, but uh, as Gemma has said in the chat, if anyone has any questions for her, uh, she's very, very happy to answer those. And yeah, what a lovely, uh, what a lovely presentation. And isn't it wonderful to see all the love coming for Albatelli? <laughs> um, another, uh, another presentation now. Um, on Alvatelli driven exposure of the misuse of public resources in an election campaign. Um, so this is over to Jayan Hoffman uh, from Gong in Croatia. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining in and thanks to my society for the kind invitation to this show and tell session. Uh, I'm going to take my chance is on the screen sharing function now and I think you can see my initial slide right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. <clears throat> so hello everybody. My name is Drajan Hoffman uh, speaking on behalf of Gong, an NGO from Zagreb, Croatia about something that's very close to our core activities, which uh, oftentimes pertain to elections and other, other processes of citizen participation. And in particular, Alavatelli was very helpful to us in exposing the misuse of public resources in an election campaign taking place in Croatia just this year, in fact, just a couple of months ago. Uh, trying to set the stage, uh, the context was uh, that local elections took place in Croatia in uh, spring, that is in May of 2021. Uh, and these local elections are quite a complicated affair in Croatia, as even such a small 
stay a small country is uh, very much uh, fragmented in terms of territorial administration in as many as 556 local administrations the those being cities or municipalities and those grouped into 20 counties and when you take uh, into account the fact that uh, this election is a parallel election of both executive and representative bodies that is uh, mayors and co county prefects are elected uh, while it, on other ballots rep representatives to county assemblies or city councils are also elected plus municipal councils are elected where applicable you can see that this election is in fact several thousand uh, micro elections taking place at the same time our tip off was a call in from a citizen who noticed that a youtube channel named jir tv which is somewhat difficult to translate but a jir would be sort of around trying to go go around the place as in a walkabout was very intensely active during two weeks in april which is very indicative because this is the time when the official uh, or rather before the official election campaign was taking place and this uh, channel was very proactive in offering quite really quaint footage of seaside towns and villages across several counties in croatia both of very successful local projects and uh, in something akin to veiled invitations to citizens for these successful trends to continue and in each of these videos available on the youtube channel incumbent mayors were very prominently featured uh, this is one example of one of those lovely videos featuring this journalist uh, he, on the left hand side of the photo here named uh, Davor Jorkutic I believe who appeared in a number of cities every time uh, very standing very near to the incumbent uh, mayors and presenting what advances were made in the quality of life in these cities in the past uh, in the past uh, term of the local government and as we would so as we would soon find out uh, these videos were followed or made possible by a slew of service contracts with the digital media group which is a company operated by by the aforementioned journalist and in fact these contracts were very formulaic uh, each of them provided for the company to ensure 30 minutes of footage including a talk with the mayor which would be broadcast at least twice on local television uh, and would be uh, promoted for 30 days on social media targeting an 18 to 65 year old audience uh, following during and fall and uh, after the the election campaign note that the 18 plus audience are also voters uh the price was uh, also fairly formulaic 2600 euro for this package of services so uh being the curious bunch that we are we used our own national elevateli based platform called dimamo pravoznati we have the right to know.org to send out a generic query to as many as 68 cities and municipalities that we found uh, listed on this YouTube channel. So really our work was cut out for us by, by, the, uh, by this business enterprise. And we asked each of those to provide us with a contract, uh, the exact contract which covers the filming and broadcasting services provided by, by the company that was engaged. Why it was important to ask, because according to our National Act on Financing of Political Activities and uh, Election Campaigns, it is forbidden to fund, to fund political parties and uh, campaigns from state bodies, public companies, legal persons with public prerogatives, bodies of local self-governments, public companies owned by local self-governments. So uh, essentially what we suspected was that uh, public resources were being misused through these videos to effectively provide campaigns to incumbent mayors and to the exclusion of their political opponents, giving the incumbents an unfair electoral advantage because they could directly sign uh, the contracts with this company to have a video broadcast of, of their successes and advertise, uh, advertise their uh, candidacy effectively for the next four year term. Uh, the outcome of the 68 queries was, according to this breakdown below, we actually had a very successful turnout with the 54 uh, complete responses from the cities and municipalities, which proved that they in fact had uh, had contracts with this company. Several more were partially successful or never came back. One of them refused was a refusal because allegedly the uh, the city had no. Uh, active contract with the company but it might be in the, the case that 
the um, the cooperation was arranged in some other way. Uh, the aftermath was fairly scarce. Uh, unfortunately, some media attention was brought he, uh, to the case by a weekly newspaper and a very highly read uh, creation language news portal, but uh, there were no legal sanctions whatsoever. In fact, the State Electoral, Electoral Commission uh, gave us a direct answer that they cannot determine the uh, activities of potential, uh, that is not yet confirmed, candidates. So in the first phase of the of the electoral campaign, they weren't sure if the incumbent mayors would in fact be candidates. You could call this a cynical re response, but technically it's true. Uh, this uh, was followed by the interpretation, again, of the State Electoral Commission that they could not determine that public resources were being misused for, uh, for campaign purposes because, according to their interpretation, it's entirely possible that these videos were produced by uh, in the goal of uh, regularly promoting the activities of local self-governments. The very fact that it took place during the election campaign period was not sufficient proof in and of itself. So in conclusion, our lesson, our takeaway from this case was that while our technological capabilities for ensuring FOI might be formidable, they are no match for a lack of political will, which is very prevalent and plagues us on a daily basis. So thank you uh, again for listening to my talk. Thank you, Blue Sky Timer, for being such a convenient oppressor in my peripheral view all the time and looking forward to hearing the other talks. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Jaden. That was that was really interesting um, and not too cynical at all. I think it's it's really important to, to be able to use FOI for this, even if uh, we can't immediately get a win out of it. I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's all good evidence for the future. Uh, right, moving swiftly along, um, we've got our very own Alex Parsons next, um, our research associate at My Society. Uh, take it away, Alex. Cool. One second. Um... That, one. that all up okay great so um i'm alex parsons i'm a researcher at my society um in the uk my society runs what they know.com and internationally develops the alavitelli software that supports similar sites across europe and around the world and in the last year our research teams focused on some questions that are a few steps removed from that software we've been thinking about the wider regulatory context for foi services exists in how digital tools can help with that, but also whether there are problems that need to go to wider changes to address the issues. So to start with, like my society is a civic tech organization and civic tech is all about finding the pressure points where existing rights or processes can be supercharged for the use of technology. Adam's head is used in a number of ways to try and improve the effectiveness and the impact of the local system of um, FOI. And this sort of works in three key ways. So it exposes the access points by making it easier to make FOI requests and so reduces barriers to use. You can help scale the public information by putting the results of FOI requests online. This means that public information becomes more widely available for search engines rather than requiring requests. And something we've rolling out in the last few years is the idea of uh, helping high impact stories. So this is a set of pro features aimed at journalists, researchers and campaigners to help produce high impact works using FOI. Uh, this is currently being rolled out in the UK and with our partners across Europe. And the issue with this approach is it says, if you have a function access to information regime, putting technology on the top of that can make it work better and more efficiently. But what if, hang on, what if the, there we go. What if the access to information system just doesn't work? And the practical reality of um, FOI or many countries is that especially for potentially high impact requests is information not only may be withheld but withheld in ways that are outside either the letter or the spirit of law. Some of this can be addressed through technology. Just as authorities learn what they can get away with, the experienced requester will learn how best to approach refusals and we can use uh, digital tools to try and take that expertise and make it available to inexperienced requesters. What do they know in the UK currently has a system of refusal advice which takes users through a questionnaire um, based on the kind of re refusal they got and offer snippets to help build a case for internal review. Given we know in the UK that internal review can result in more information being released, giving people more ability to make appeals should, and we're going to check on this in a few months time, lead to new information being released that wouldn't have been without that help. So in some sense, the appeal system is just another access point and we can put technology on top of that access point to help people access it. 
but it's also a process that varies a lot more between different jurisdictions and so it's a feature that's hard to scale internationally. In different countries and even inside different areas of the same country, entirely different processes for appeals apply. In some jurisdictions, the appeal process might be quite a useful and effective tool. In others, it may be hard, hard, expensive to access or just ineffective. In these situations, the problem is further upstream and hard to resolve with digital tools over the top of the system. So for the last few, no, for this year, we've been pursuing two research projects. One which we published back in April, looked at the situation in the UK and opportunities for improving the overall framework of FOI law. And the other, which we aim to publish towards the end of the year, looks at the wider European context of appeals and regulation of access to information. I'm gonna start trailing a bit of the work we've done on the European side and then double back to the work on the UK and see how it fits into that. So the area we're sort of interested in is the how when, when someone is unhappy with the response to something, how that is appealed and what the regulatory system is that ensures that the uh, public authorities are working effectively. And there is often oversight bodies that are charged with that in different countries. And this, so to start with, just asking two questions about these different kinds of bodies. Is it a specific body concerned with freedom of information or is it a general body? And do they have any formal powers to investigate or are they mediators? And if you put those in a grid, we get this. So generally speaking, information commissioner is a term, they're annoying to me about these terms, they don't entirely work all the time, but an information commissioner is like a specific version of an ombudsman who is more concerned with information law. Um, in countries where there is no specific or general one, generally you can always appeal to the courts. And so that is like the, uh, the option of last resort if there's no specific thing set up. And th these categories don't work entirely well because we don't distinguish often between the idea of mediator information commissioners and regulator information commissioners. Like we're, the, we're the first, mostly speaking, solves problems by um, bringing the parties to bring the parties together in a room, trying to uh, provide advice and mediate the dispute. Whereas the other has more powers to compel the release of information, and we don't really distinguish between this and terminology. So it's just render it's a new language, just explain how these different systems are operating. Um, generally. It's, and it's all, it's all a bit blurry anyway, because it's not that a regulatory information commissioner will always work for enforcement. Generally speaking, they will do a lot of work for mediation as well. So this works, it, it's, it's not, these are not clear divisions, but it sort of helps shape how different countries pursue in their regulation. And to explore a bit more what differences there are between different regimes, we've used Access Info's RTI ratings uh, to create separate scores for free questions. How powerful is the oversight body? Is the oversight body politically independent? And how effective is the overall review process? Using these three different scales, we've applied a clustering approach to identify which countries are most similar to each other and made six groups of countries. I'm not gonna to go too much into detail on that now, but what is interesting is when you contrast the score for political independence of an oversight body with the kind of powers it has, and you get this map. And so can you see my mouse? So I can, cool. Uh, so down here, we've got clusters two and four, which have low political dependence, but also not high oversight bodies. Up here, we've got cluster one, which is quite good at both. And I think the interesting, so just to give some examples on that. So uh, cluster one has got high scores for both. That includes Albania, Croatia, Denmark, and Ireland in that set. Um, but the interesting ones are group ones in group five and ones in group three who have different journeys to go on to become you know, a more effective regulator. So for instance, down here, there are, these are independent regulators who are, generally speaking, that's about financial installation of decision-making, but uh, that's, but they're not, they don't have a lot of power. Whereas up here, they have a lot of power. No, they have a lot of power, but not a lot of political independence. This one here is the UK. And this sort of applies to our recommendations is we think that the body in the UK should be more independent and move the oversight of it from uh, Parliament to the government. But this is quite a special journey in the sense that very few countries in Europe have this specific problem. And so the lessons from generalizable from the UK is not that other countries have different problems and each path to a better regulator, it was going to be unique. And that is almost exactly on time. Oh, okay, stop sharing. Bang on. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, and yes, that uh, the report into the UK is available on our website. There's lots of really good, uh, lots of really good stuff in there. And yeah, hopefully we will be putting out that that other report uh, looking into regulation in Europe in the next few months. We may actually be reaching out to some of you to <laughs> to talk to you and get your expertise and your input on that if uh, if we're able to do so. 
Uh, right, moving swiftly on, we have Samuel Gauthier from Madada, France, uh, running an access to information platform in France, obstacles and success stories. Hello, uh, I'm Samuel. Uh, nice to talk to, to everyone and I'm really glad to participate in that event and I really appreciate uh, all the work that you do with uh, Ala Vitelli and I'm glad to meet over similar platforms in Europe. Uh, I'll talk to you about Madada, which is uh, now two years old uh, Ala Vitelli platform. And I will um, start by telling you a bit about this platform. So we launched it in October 2019. We are, um, we are Open Knowledge Foundation France. And it's a project that we have in mind for several years and that we are glad to make it now real. Um, we have now more than one than a thousand requests and it's increasing uh, a lot since we've launched uh, all the, the pro features of Alavitelli. Uh, and we have now uh, an, an impact and uh, we also have uh, an awareness of the platform, which is really good and, and, uh, and our figures keep on increasing. And uh, so we'll talk to you today about how we, ma we have managed to launch this platform or the difficulties we have and to give you and to finish to give you some success stories that we've had over the two the two years uh, running this this website. Um, so if I give you some context about open data in France, I will give you the metaphor of uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You probably all know the Leaning Tower of Pisa of Pisa. Maybe you've been there. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, building, a beautiful monument uh, that is known for for its uh, its leaning, but uh, we always we don't always know why it's leaning. So the reason it's leaning is that because it has unstable foundations, and it's a bit of the same with open data in France. If we consider open data as uh, as a nice uh, monument and the foundation as freedom of information. So why is it a beautiful building open data in France? Uh, I mean, things are not always perfect, but uh, it's a situation in which open data is mandatory by the law since October 19, October 2018. Uh, it's, it's ongoing, this effort about open, opening data. Uh, yesterday, more than uh, 500 commitments were announced by all uh, government departments. I, I don't say they're always ambitious commitments. Uh, I wouldn't say that but um, it's still uh, an ongoing effort and, and the government is, uh, is aware of the importance of open data and it's a, it's a political priority in the moment. Uh, the country, if we look at the rankings, it's a second country in the OECD uh, ranking. It's a third country in the EU open data maturity report. Again, uh, it's not always perfect and, and I could talk during hours about all the issues that we face with open data, but I'm here more focused about the foundation of this tower, which is the which is freedom of information. So we have a law that is uh, that is quite old. It started in 1978. Uh, it's called the CADAS as uh, the Commission d'accès aux documents administratifs. It's a uh, quite easy procedure. Procedures. It's uh, it has a large definition of administra administrative document, which is what you can request. And it's now a constitutional right, so everyone can uh, can use uh, FOIA quite easily in France. But we have some, several issues. First is that awareness of the law is still weak among citizens. Uh, it's not a, a law that is really known and a, a right that people uh, know. I'm always uh, amazed by how many people don't know about this law. But also it's not known by many civil servants, which makes our work even more difficult. Uh, requests, when you send your requests, they're often bypassed, they're not even considered. Uh, on Madada, we have more than 50% uh, of our requests that still await response. And it's, uh, it's something, uh, it's a difficulty that we face, uh, that we face all the time with our requests. Um, and the thing is that if we look in, in government administration, FOIA officers, procedures are not in place in government administration, which is also linked to the fact that they often don't answer. And uh, too often they wait for uh, the mediator uh, interven intervention uh, from, from like ADA to, to, to make a, 
uh, a statement uh, and um, before releasing any document, especially on documents where we know it's it's possible by the law. So we have very unstable foundation on which we build Madada, and Madada is part of an ongoing movement to uh, to increase the awareness of the importance of uh, of this law and uh, of freedom of information. So we started to to make Madada more than three years ago uh, with a small team uh, with the help of Laurent, Pierre, Pascal, and uh, Eda, and several others which I cannot mention, and other uh, organization that help us. Uh, Built, uh, built Metadata, such as My Society, Transparencia, Hello Cloud, uh, Ouvre Boite, and other organizations. One thing we did is that we had to import a quite massive database on all the, it's called the public service directory. It's like 50,000 contacts, which is a uh, difficulty. It was, was the only database that we have that was comprehensive about uh, the French local and national uh, government and all their agencies. Uh, we also had to request LACADA, so the mediator, about their own email database of their contact in the administration. Do you follow me? So they have contact in every administration. It's mandatory by the law. It's called Prada. Uh, it's not the people that are, uh, that are well dressed. It's only a person responsible for access to document administratif, which means uh, all the persons that are your contact when you have a, a FOIA request. And we had to send a request, which they first refused and during uh, more than six months. And then they approved and they sent us this document that they really didn't want to, to release at first. And we also spent lots of time uh, explaining civil servants and citizens about our approach. So we have uh, now a website that works pretty well. And so I'd like to share you some uh, quickly some success stories. Uh, uh, there are plenty of articles mentioning Madada, so I will not uh, look at that, but more about civil society uh, organization using Madada. So one example is uh, what uh, Secours Catholique, uh, so it's an NGO uh, with Equitas uh, made with uh, Madada to look at the sanctions for welfare benefits. Uh, they, they talk to uh, department uh, department councils, uh, to, to local council and ask how many sanctions did they release for welfare benefits. And they found that more than 115,000 households each, each year are withdrawn from the welfare revenues each year. And they had a difficulty is that only a third of, uh, of all these, um, these uh, these departments uh, answered with uh, an acknowledgement of receipt and only 13 on 100 actually released the data. Um, another example is a virus, uh, COVID uh, virus uh, concentration in sewage water. Uh, we had a request from COVID Tracker, which is a, a national website to track uh, COVID. And uh, it took six months to, to, get, to obtain this data in spite of the of the urgency of get, getting access to the data, but now it's uh, integrated and used uh, a lot to track alterna alternatively uh, how uh, COVID is spreading in, in the country. Uh, there is also La Quadrature, which uh, is uh, struggling against uh, surveillance. Uh, that is using Madada to uh, track uh, many things, such as how smart city projects uh, use uh, surveillance, digital surveillance. So they look at uh, public procurement in, for example, here with uh, Paris 2024 Olympics. So all the innovative uh, solutions for safety that, that are, uh, that are um, used for, for the Olympics. Uh, they also look at all the location of uh, surveillance cameras that are uh, approved with uh, prefectorial orders. And so we have, we've had uh, success and they are uh, actually uh, 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 using a lot of uh, Madada and uh, advocating for its use. And we also, we have done our own investigation here on the transparency of uh, public procurement and subsidies in France. It's, it's mandatory in many ways to, to open this data. And we, we found that so if you look only at the green uh, departments, it's only the one that released the data that we, that we wanted and we found that among the 188 requests, we have only re received only 61 positive answer, less than 32%. Uh, percent. So to, to conclude on that, um, 
metadata is used a lot. It has now a, a good awareness in the public, so which is really good. It also it's part of a campaign to improve the freedom of information law, which has, as I have shown you, is quite unstable and uh, needs really in, in an emergency uh, some improvement. And uh, but we've also had some success, and and we can show now that civil society is using a lot. Uh, for yeah, uh, to 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 use uh, in their advocacy efforts. So thanks for listening, and I'm and I'll be glad to to change with you. Thank you so much, Samuel. That was really great, and uh, I think even though we all here want our FOI um, systems to be better, it's definitely important to uh, to celebrate the wins. So thank you very much for that. Uh, right. It's already uh, our final speaker. Um, so this is Patricia Anderson uh, from Give Them Time Scotland, um, a change in the law for school scarters in Scotland through FOI. Uh, so if Samuel, you can stop uh, sharing and we can get Patricia. There we go. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone, and thanks very much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about a campaign that I co-founded, which laid, uh, relied heavily upon FOI responses, which we gained through the What Do They Know website, which is part of my society. So before I kind of go into exactly how we used FOI, I need to give a little bit of background to the campaign. Um, first of all, I should let you know I'm speaking as a parent today who co-founded this campaign three years ago. Um, and we were campaigning for a further year of nursery funding in Scotland for all children who were deferring their primary one start. Um, to start, like many campaigns, um, our campaign started because of personal experience. Um, there was a group of parents across the country who were realising that their children were not ready to start school at the sort of designated age or the expected age in Scotland, which is usually between about four and a half and five and a half. And uh, myself, along with some other parents, managed to inform ourselves through the web, uh, internet um, that we actually had a legal right to defer our children, even if they were over five and a half, as long as they had not turned age six by the school starting date. Um, so very quickly, then this is the law in Scotland, which had actually been in force since 1980 and the highlighted section explains that any child who's not five by the school start date, which is inevitably in August, but very slightly by each of the 32 local authority areas in Scotland, then they don't have to start school until the following August. So as an example, just to kind of explain that further, if your child's date of birth is the 15th of August 2017, then in 2022, next year, um, if the school start date in that council was 14th of August, then they wouldn't have to go to school until the following year, even if it was a day before or a day after they turned six. But this is little known in Scotland. Most people know that if your child is born in January and February, that you have a legal right to defer and you will receive the, the all prized nursery funding for a further year when um, the mid-August to December born cohort who are still four at the school start date didn't, it wasn't very widely known, a research um, survey we did nationally um, in 2018, which had nearly 700 parents in every single local authority area responding, showed that only 16% of parents knew that in August you could defer a child. Um, so we started to, you know, get quite anxious about the fact that it was very difficult for us to find this information. Um, and then once we found it, we realised that actually, even though we have a legal right to defer our children who we think we, we don't want them to start school until they're older, that was a relief, great. But we don't have an automatic entitlement to continued nursery funding. And for many families, that is absolutely essential to enable them to for this, the, both parents to work or to, to, to meet around family life. And in Scotland, you have a 99% uptake rate in the mo at the moment for age three to five year olds in nursery places. So what inevitably this meant was that the, there was a discrepancy between the actual legal right to defer a child who hadn't turned five by the school start date and the entitlement to automatic continued nursery funding. Um, and really that was down to individual councils, whether they would grant that or not. No parent has ever said to us, yeah, I don't mind if they grant it or not, because obviously there's a lot of money involved in that, um, the, the, the expense to the parent. Another issue was that if the council refused it, that they could, um, 
they could oust your child from that council run nursery so that you would have to then move them to another nursery, a private one, all the unsettling of that for the child and the family, and then the additional cost because private nursery was much more expensive than council nursery. So there was a lot of issues here. Um, so we established that there was these discrepancies from anecdotal evidence given by parents, but then we really wanted to, to prove it. And that's where FOI came in. Initially, we sent FOIs to the 32 local authorities um, by private email. And my goodness, it was hard. We are all lay people. Some people had um, processed FOIs through their work, but suddenly in our free time, when you've got young children and a job and everything else to juggle, you had 32 FOIs to process and process the jargon that came with them. And then, um, you know, sort them all in your email inbox and, you know, just all the, the additional time requirements of that. Um, and then for me, one thing that I hadn't expected, but which became pretty scary, actually, I'm not a journalist, I'm not trained in data processing, um, one of the things that I find very hard was knowing what I could share and what I couldn't share. So, for example, and this was the, the, the tale of a, an email signature that I got from a local authority. And in number one, it says, this is sent in confidence for the addressee only. It may contain legally privileged information. And I'm sorry, that word legally just sets off alarm bells for me. Data protection, GDPR. I thought the freedom of information when it was free, I thought the onus was on them to decide what to share. And suddenly me as a private citizen with no training suddenly had to have this um, uber sense of what I could share or not. Would I be liable if um, I shared information that was sensitive or official? Some of these emails were labeled with those terms and it became this, you know, I was going in this, you know, vortex of going around my head and analyzing it. What could I do and what could I not do? And it actually, you know, if I hadn't found the What Do They Know website, it would have been prohibitive to what we actually managed to achieve in the campaign in the end and you know actually getting that information out there so here's some of the information that we found sending through the what do they know website was brilliant because it took the pressure off any individuals to decide can i share this or not because everything's public everything's got a web link the, the authorities that respond know that it's going into the public domain and therefore the onus is on them as it should be to be transparent to provide what they can provide or not so you can see here that we established across all the 32 local authority councils in scotland the rate of approving these requests for funding over the last three years we've used a sort of traffic light system without the amber to identify different local authorities and their rates of approving these or not and you can see that there's discrepancies there while we've gone up from 13 councils approving all requests in 2018-19 to 19 now um, you know if you live in one of those unfortunate authorities that doesn't you know have the the automatic funding policy then it's a very difficult time for you as a parent to decide whether to move your child nursery can you afford it but in good news um, we got we lobbied using the information that we we established from the What Do They Know website or FOIs, and we successfully lobbied for the law to be changed. So in Scotland, from August two thousand and twenty three, any child taking up that nineteen eighty. 43 year old um, right to defer their school start will automatically be guaranteed a further year of nursery funding by ticking a box and that is just such peace of mind for us as campaigners to know that other parents won't have to go through what many parents have suffered and experienced over the last few years and to have to potentially make a, a decision about their child's best interests and in con in conflict with what they can afford thank you what do they know in my society three seconds to go <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. That was a that's a really lovely illustration uh, of using FOI to to achieve a specific goal. Um, and yeah, again, lovely to to know that there are there are great successes in the world. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, uh, the last hour has gone by really quickly. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, as I said at the beginning, we've got an exciting new program of, of work uh, attached to TikTok uh, Labs. I will get it right one day. Um, and as I said before, if you stay on the mailing list, uh, we'll be sending information around about that very soon. We're just um, in the process of finalizing um, the program with the newly set up steering group. So we will be in touch shortly. Um, Sign up for, for updates. Um, as I said, if you have any questions for any of our speakers or if you just want to reach out and, and make connections with them, that's fine. We can we can arrange all of that. Uh, but either way, thank you very much, FOI enthusiasts, and have a great rest of your right to know day. Bye.